Charles Whelan. Welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. It's good to be with you. Yeah, so I'm really excited to have you on because uh, there's so many topics to cover. Uh, you write fiction, you write uh, economics books, books about money. So I'm really excited to get into a lot of areas. But before we get started, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, what you do, and uh, why you wrote wrote the, the this is one of them, the Naked series, as some people call it, and then the book right behind me, uh, we came, we saw, we left. Well, the more I explain about my background, maybe the more it will make sense that I've written books ranging from a travelogue around the world to a book advocating for a third political party to the Naked series, as you said. I am someone who's worked at the intersection of journalism, politics, and public policy pretty much my whole life. My current day job is teaching public policy at Dartmouth College. I teach classes ranging from international policy. So I've got a class on South Africa at the moment, uh, for example, to education policy, to basic economics. But I'm not a traditional academic in the sense that I don't do academic research. Most of what I write is about important policy ideas with an eye towards a general audience, informed lay readers. And I think that separates me from a lot of academics. I got my writing start as a speechwriter for the governor of Maine. That was one of my first introductions to politics. I was later a speechwriter for the mayor of Chicago for a little time when he was mayor, and then mostly for that first year after he was mayor. I've also been a journalist. I covered the Midwest for The Economist magazine, which people may recognize as a global news magazine based out of London. And I've run for Congress. Unsuccessfully, I suppose I should point out, in Chicago in 2008, 2009, when Rahm Emanuel was appointed chief of staff for Barack Obama, that created an open seat in my district. I ran to replace my lost in a crowded field. But I think having run, and of course, writing and teaching about public policy gave me some sense of how hard it is to use the political system to do things that seem so obvious to those of us on the outside. Right. And uh, I actually was not aware of the fact that you ran for Congress. And uh, so how was how was that experience like? It's terrible, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is why I think everybody should do it. You know, I, I think those of us who care a lot about policy should care a lot about politics because that's how you make policy. And we're kind of like NFL fans sitting in a Barca lounger yelling at the television without a full appreciation of what it's like to be on the field when it's 10 below zero in Green Bay and you're playing against a team where the linemen are 340 pounds. It's hard uh, in part because the news cycle is quick. It's increasingly nasty, although I should point out that my race was not nasty. I actually got along with the other candidates quite well. The most onerous part about it is the fundraising. I probably had to raise six or $7,000 a day, which is, it's not easy ever, but you know, on day 10, you've already tapped your easy donors and you wake up on a, day 11, you got to find another $7,000 because you're spending it. All those staff people working on all those leased computers in your leased office space are spending your money. So I, I would say it's a great experience. It's a good way to listen to people's concerns. It's a very good way to get better at articulating your positions. It's a very good way to think deeply about your own positions because people are going to ask you about everything. It's a very good way to emphasize with people who are actually in the arena, but it's really hard. And I would say the fundraising part is probably what would keep me from doing it again. Yeah, and, and um, I know you founded an organization called United America. Uh, how does, what is the mission of United America and how does that tie into your congressional run? United America is designed to re-empower the political center. My theory of change is that, which is not genius, is that part of the reason the political system is not working is that we're so polarized. Having a 50-50 split in the Senate is a pretty darn good example. But you can actually, if I were showing you the PowerPoint, you can look at the ideological composition of the House of Representatives, for example. And if you go back to the 1970s, because there were more Southern Democrats and because there were more New England Republicans, with the Southern Democrats being the most conservative in that party and the New England Republicans being the most liberal, there was a lot more ideological overlap between the two parties. So 
Southern Democrats might actually be more conservative than New England Republicans, but it meant that they were more likely to find common ground. Bills like Medicare, the National Highway Act, many Social Security, many of the big pieces of legislation that shaped our country were more or less bipartisan. If you want a crazy tidbit, even when Bill Clinton was president, he signed welfare reform, and that had more Republican votes in the House than Democratic votes. And just imagine a world now where Biden signs a piece of legislation that has more Republican votes than Democrats. It's inconceivable. It's, it's increasingly unlikely that either one vote from the other party. So the point is, it's very hard to govern a country when there's no ideological overlap between the two parties. The Centrist Manifesto was the book that I wrote arguing for a third political party of the middle. I said, look, if you need some connective tissue, the two parties aren't gonna do it on, on their own, why not create a third political party? And you can see what it might look like when you look at Joe Manchin and Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski, a lot of the senators who have influence because they're playing in that moderate middle. So I said, let's create a third political party for a lot of reasons we can talk about if you want. That's impractical in part because of the way we elect our politicians in a first past the post system. So you can win with 43, 4% or 44% of the vote. You don't need a majority. But it has evolved into United America, which works on process reforms that we believe will help us get along better. For example, ranked choice voting, which is a better system, I would argue, for aggregating all our preferences. It's friendlier to independents. It encourages more political competition. It requires every person who wins elected office to have a majority by the time the process unfolds. We're also working very hard to reform primaries. I would argue that one of the things that really drives partisanship are Republican and Democratic primaries. In many states, they're closed to those who are not in uh, to those who are not in one of the two parties. So you get the most extreme members of the Republican and Democratic Party participating in the primaries. That's a small fraction of the electorate overall. So this small, highly partisan group picks the candidates, and the rest of us, with the you know the fastest and largest voting bloc in America being independents, go and choose between the two candidates that these unrepresentative, highly partisan groups have offered up. The, the example I use is, imagine that you had a student council election where the two candidates were nominated by the football team and the marching band. And that's, those are the choices you got. And the rest of us are like, well, you know, there are a lot of other people at this school who might be better. No, 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 those are your choices because the football team voted in their primary, the band voted in, your, in their primary, the rest of us couldn't participate. So those are, that's what we're doing now. If we get more ranked choice voting, it's passed in Alaska, it's gonna be used in the mayoral race in New York City, then it's, it's more likely that we'll elect more independents and maybe even a third party, but we're starting with those process reforms. Yeah, and um, I was about to mention, I'm, I'm, I live in New York and we, we're gonna have, I think our first ranked choice primary. Which uh, is great because you've got yeah. so many candidates on the Democratic ballot. Right. Right. And, you know, just to kind of let people know how it works, if there's, say, five or seven or, in my case, 13 candidates on the ballot, you go in and you rank usually your top four or five choices. Jay, look, this is the guy I really like. This woman would be pretty good if he doesn't win. This guy's my third choice and so on. What happens is if there's not a majority winner in the first round, so you take everybody's first choice votes, and if somebody gets 50% plus one, that person wins, just like a normal election. But if not, then you take the person who got the lowest number of votes, you eliminate them. Everybody who sort of supported that person now gets their second choice. Their second choice becomes their first choice and you do it all over again. So to think about how it might've affected America, for example, you're probably too young, but if you go back to 2000, when you had the Bush v. Gore presidential race, everything gets messed up in Florida because you've got Ralph Nader on the ballot. Now, Ralph Nader is not going to win president of the United States, but enough people vote for him, whose second choice presumably would have been Gore, that he pulls votes from Gore and George W. Bush wins Florida and therefore the overall election. Now, if you had ranked choice voting, people could go in and say, I want to send a message. I'm going to support Ralph Nader. Well, he gets 6% of the vote. He gets eliminated. Everyone who voted for him, their second choice, maybe some of their second choices might have been George W. Bush, you never know. They get their second choice, and either Bush or Gore wins with a majority in Florida. Nader does not affect 
that outcome. So uh, we're hoping that that'll be less distorting of what people really want to see in Washington or in their states. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good policy initiative. I, I like the idea. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to how it's going to be implemented in New York. But uh, the common complaint I get, for example, from uh, some family members that I have, I have a lot of independent, uh, registered, I guess, independents. And it's frustrating in New York, for example, in New York City, that when you elect a mayor, uh, it's usually the person that wins the Democratic primary, but they can't vote in the Democratic primary. And yeah. how, yeah, how that's a problem? Yeah. Yes. yeah. How yeah. would you go about uh, reforming that? Because I could see arguments against allowing non Democrats or, say, non Republicans from oh, voting so in their own what primaries. I would, uh, what I would do is, is what Alaska did in 2020. So while we were all watching the presidential circus, something really interesting happened in Alaska. They passed by referendum, ranked choice voting with open nonpartisan primaries. So everybody in Alaska who wants to be a senator or governor runs in the same primary, just like a student council election. It's just a first round election. The top four winners advance to the general election. It could be three Republicans and a Democrat. It could be four Democrats. Everybody gets to vote. Every candidate is in the primary, irrespective of party. You vote for the one you like best. The top four advance to the general election. So you go into the general election ballot, you see the four choices, and then they, they use ranked choice voting to determine who wins that second round election. So there is a primary election but it is not a partisan primary and everybody gets to vote, unlike the situation you described in New York, which is just like Chicago. I, you know, I described my election, what I neglected to say is that I ran in the Democratic primary and whoever won that primary was gonna be the general election winner. Everybody knew that to be the case and that's exactly what happened. Right, and for, in terms of polariz polarization in, in America, and do you see this as a, global trend. So for example, in European countries, you've seen, uh, for example, in France, you have more far right, I guess, uh, politicians coming to the fore, uh, I think in Hungary and Poland and, and yes. other countries. But in the United States, what do you attribute? Uh, I know there, mu there must be a multitude of factors, but what is the main reason people are so polarized? There are a multitude of factors. And one of the problems is that they all interact with each other in very dangerous ways. And they're all relatively recent. And I don't, I don't know which is the most important. I'm not sure the political scientists know. What I can do is just kind of tick off what they are and we can talk through them if you want. So one is residential sorting. More than at any point in American history, we're more likely to live and work near people who share our political beliefs. That's a function of suburbanization and all kinds of other things. But if you look around your community, the people, and we think a lot about race and we're, we're also racially segregated, but less than in the past. If you live around someone who doesn't look like you because they're a different race or ethnicity, they're probably similar to you politically. So we're getting more diverse in some measures, but less diverse in others namely politics, but the important thing is you're living around people who are kind of parroting your own political beliefs. They probably have the same education level, same income, or, or broadly speaking. And, Meanwhile, and you have the so rise of social media. You have gerrymandering, which we've had for a long time, but the parties have gotten better at it. That's where you pick, you draw the legislative boundaries to favor your own party. But just let's play this out for a second. So now let's suppose you're the Democrats in Illinois. They control all branches of government, which means that based on the 2020 census, they will draw the Illinois legislative districts for Congress. They will draw them, not surprisingly, to favor Democrats, and Republicans do this in Pennsylvania and other places, so it's not unique to one party or the other. But what that means is that the most Democrats will, will be in a safe Democratic seat. In other states, most Republicans will be in a safe Republican seat. Well, let's go back to something we've already talked about. That means the only person likely to challenge you in your safe seat is somebody in your own primary. So if you're a Republican, you're worried about a challenge from the right. 
If you're a Democrat, you're worried about a challenge from the left. And that person challenging you is going to be more liberal or more conservative than you are. Therefore, the way to keep your seat safe is not to compromise with the other party, which is an essential ingredient for governing. It should just be ideologically pure so that you won't get primary, a word, by the way, that was not a verb when I was growing up. That would be another social media is just a, the online version of residential sorting. You log on to Facebook and miraculously every post you read reinforces exactly what you, your own brilliant thoughts. And then feeling brilliant, you turn on the news and you choose Fox or MSNBC or whatever. You just kind of dial up your own ideological cocktail. That's a relatively new agreement. I grew up, you know, I'm not that old, but I grew up before there was cable television news as entertainment and as a profit center. And of course, how do you become a profit center as a news source? You become slightly crazy. You cater to your base. You focus on entertainment, not on presenting news in a way that fosters civic engagement, collaboration, and the like. So like that plus money is more important than ever. How do you raise money? Well, you do it by appealing to those who are the most politically engaged. They tend to be the most hyper-partisan folks. So that exacerbates, it's like an accelerant to everything that I've already described. So, you know, that's a lot of answers to your question, but part of the reason we're having such a partisanship problem is because all of these factors have evolved over roughly the same time frame, which is the last 10 to 20 years. And, you know, to your point, uh, I was listening to a recent uh, Bill Maher clip and he had a, like at the end of his show, he does a, a thing where he kind of talks on one topic or, 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 or the other. And he called Americans a silly people in reference to the Lawrence of Arabia uh, line. And it seems to me, and I, I'm, I'm a pretty young person, like I'm, I'm 23. And it seems to me that we're raising a generation of very pessimistic children, right? Or kids or uh, young adults. Um, and there, there have been a lot of uh, researchers, for example, Nassim Nicholas Taleb and, and uh, some others have advocated for people to stop reading the news because it, it makes people way more negative and it doesn't actually teach you that much about the world. Uh, I tend to take that worldview. I, I'm always open to having my mind changed. But are you concerned as a college professor, obviously, that we're raising a generation of pessimistic kids rather than having some optimism? I am deeply concerned. I would add to pessimism anxious. And you are an anxious and pessimistic generation for some understandable reasons. So you're 23. Let's, let's walk through your lived experience. So you were very, very young when 9-11 happened, but that was certainly a defining, you know, and, and we've been concerned about big scale terrorist incidents ever since, you know, not wrongly. You move, you're probably what, you know, a small child when you get the financial crisis. Right? So, which is, you know, so distressing for so many families, both on the employment front, on the housing front, you see this kind of collapse. On the institutional side, the church has been disgraced, certainly the Catholic church, big business from pharmaceutical industries to other kind of allegations of price gouging. So institutions that people used to look to as a source of respect and stability have come under great fire. You then get into the, the, the Trump presidency and regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, this has certainly not been the best example of how a nation might comport itself with regard to politics, things are nastier and more superficial. There's less ability to get things done. I, mean, I teach this education policy class and we were talking about No Child Left Behind, which was passed around 2001, other than the Patriot Act, which was a direct response to 9-11, it's the last really big piece of bipartisan legislation that I can remember. It means that basically in your entire lifetime, you've not seen Republicans and Democrats come together to solve a major problem. And of course, what would have been the perfect opportunity? COVID. And COVID does not arrive as an inherently Republican or Democratic problem. It's like an invasion, and it is literally an invasion. You would have expected, you would have hoped 
that the country would react as it did to Pearl Harbor or to something like that, where there's this external threat, the Cold War, and it brings the country together, allows us to paper over our ideological divisions to advance some common foe. And instead, we got into ideolo ideological brawls over everything from school openings to masks, and it, it has had the effect of further dividing us, which I wouldn't have thought possible. So um, that plus I think social media has a number of social effects unrelated to public policy, people putting their best face online and feeling insecure, uh, get cyberbullying. I think there are other things around that, that that make people arrive to adolescents with a more delicate psyche. But yeah, it's no great shock that the students I'm teaching, your peers, look around the world and are fearful and not optimistic. They've lost faith in democracy in, in some respects certainly in our system. So I, I think it's unfortunate, but entirely understandable that people are more pessimistic and more anxious. Yeah, and another thing is that um, I feel like not a lot of people walk around defending government in any way, shape or form. I, I saw your- <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I know, I, I was gonna <laughs> bring that up. I saw that uh, your TED talk and, um, and uh, I'm sure you know you go around defending government, and I think besides uh, besides I found your uh, besides your video the TED TED talk, I think there's one book I've read in the past like five six years that's just tried to do the same. Maybe I just haven't found them, but uh, Michael Lewis is short. Uh, I think it's oh, called yeah. the Fifth Risk. Right. Uh, tried to do this. We we have the same publisher. I mean. <laughs> Some ways I feel like we're soul brothers. Uh, we even have the same editor. Um, so let me give you, you know, so no, people don't defend government because when government works well, they usually don't notice. And when it doesn't work well, they just kind of annoy you. So let me give you an example, a very specific example. So in, I believe it was 1998, Bill Clinton ordered missiles to be fired at what he described as a terrorist training camp. Now, the timing was such that the Monica Lewinsky scandal had just come to light. Everybody, particularly his political opponents, said, oh, you're just trying to change the news. You're trying to use this, this military strike as a way to raise your own standing. And so, well, who was it that he was firing at? He was firing at Osama bin Laden. So the the government that we maligned, the intelligence apparatuses had decided first that Osama bin Laden was dangerous. And second, a lot of nameless, faceless, often heroic people had figured out where he was. And orders go up the chain to Clinton, who has to make this very difficult decision to effectively take out people, orders the missile strike on Osama bin Laden's training camp. Now they missed him. And of course, the criticism went on, but let's suppose they'd gotten him. He can't go on the news and say, oh, what you don't know, people, is if we hadn't gotten him, he was going to blow up the Twin Towers. You don't know that, right? So I'll give you another example. But I'm old enough that when seatbelts weren't required when I was growing up, we kind of played around the car without seatbelts. And in fact, when they were introduced, people found them to be really annoying. And in fact, for a while, you couldn't turn on your car if your seatbelt wasn't locked. And then we just kind of compromised on that dinging bell. Uh, and so people were really annoyed. Well, in 2001, um, my family rolled a Ford Explorer and we all lived because we were in seatbelts and my children were in car seats, which are also legally required. So all those things, I didn't, I never complained about seatbelts. It made sense to me. But, you know, maybe we would have been lazy that night. Maybe the research hadn't been shared with us. Maybe we wouldn't have spent so much, maybe we wouldn't have had a government approved child seat for our children. So, um, you know, people died because before they weren't wearing seatbelts. So there's a lot of stuff like that, but oftentimes when somebody, when the government saves your life because you're drinking water, it doesn't look like Flint or the next terrorist risk is averted uh, or the building doesn't collapse because it's safe you know, it doesn't catch on fire and you don't get trapped in it because there are exits and sprinklers. Oftentimes you don't know what the benefit of that was. Instead, it's just another cumbersome zoning restriction. So I, that's, you know, there are other reasons, 
Uh, but I do think that we owe a much larger debt of gratitude for people who are working, as I said, often namelessly, facelessly for not a lot of money to collectively make us better off. Right. And um, to finish up maybe on the, on the political, <laughs> political talk, I, I do want to get to your new book. Uh, what is your opinion on the current uh, political landscape with the Biden administration, the new stimulus package, uh, the effect COVID is going to have on society for years to come? and overall the future of American politics. The future of humanity. <laughs> well, you did point out, like, we're not alone. You know, Europe has got its political challenges. They're far right. So uh, they're, they're struggling with their vaccine rollout. So America's not alone in our partisanship. I'll just say parenthetically that the parliamentary systems in Europe often do a better job, though, of ameliorating that tension because you could, you've got multiple parties and you often have a center-right and a center-left party that will come together to govern. That's one way of dealing with these ideological divisions. But in terms of our political landscape, obviously COVID is one more thing to make your generation fraught, you know, like as if you weren't already anxious enough, we throw a global pandemic at you and the experts are telling us this probably won't be the last. So yes, we'll take that with us. We have not gained any more confidence in our government's ability to deal with it. Although science, and I would argue capitalism, because this is all private sector, you know, it's actually how the economy should work, which is the private sector pharmaceutical companies with a lot of resources and guidance and incentives from government. It clearly has been a collaboration. So you do get a vaccine in what is a record amount of time. So there, I do want to bookmark that source of optimism. But I think people should be concerned about our larger ability to deal with serious problems. So I'll get to the stimulus in a second, but if you think about climate change, it is, you know, existential threat gets tossed around it, but it's a, it's a serious threat to life as we know it. And we're, you know, now we're starting to do some, some things, but there's certainly not a lot of bipartisan will to tackle that. The fiscal problem, so before you get to, the, to COVID and the stimulus, I was actually reading this morning, the Medicare trust fund, which is the pot of money used to fund Medicare is going to run out of money. I believe it's within the next 20 years. Social security is not in much better shape. We've got the baby boomers continuing to age. We have healthcare costs continuing to rise much faster than inflation. All of these problems preceded COVID and they're still there. Then COVID comes along. The stimulus, a stimulus, was certainly the right thing to do. Economics tells us that when you get a massive shock and people stop spending and businesses close, you don't want that to feed on itself. If I stop going to a restaurant and the restaurant closes, then the restaurant owner lays people off. They can't make their mortgages. The banks go under. They no longer make no loans to safe businesses. We saw in 2008 that if you don't stop that cycle, it just feeds on itself until you get to a crisis point. You don't want that to happen. Some kind of stimulus, putting money in the pockets of people, making the banks better, safer, more solvent in the case of 2008, you do have to do something to stop it. Now, did it need to be as big as it was? It's not clear to me that it did. It probably could have been more finely targeted. You can blame the Biden administration for that. You could all probably also blame the Republicans. They weren't going to vote for it anyway. If they had been willing to trade their votes for maybe a smaller, better tailored stimulus, maybe that would have happened. Again, maybe Joe Biden should have taken more seriously that group of Republicans that went to meet with him. I don't know where the blame lies, but I think it probably could have been more targeted. And the question is, if we spend, and God, no, I saw this morning, what, $3 trillion, that is mostly borrowed money, at what point does that come back to bite us? Now, we've already borrowed way more than most economists thought possible if you went back 10 years. So far, we haven't seen the effects of that. Interest rates are ticking up a little now, but they're still extremely low by historical standards. Inflation is still low, though people are starting to warn about it. Some people are warning that maybe it may just be popping up in asset price bubbles. But the, you know, one of the most famous lines in economics is that things that can't go on forever must stop. And you can't borrow for forever. You can't 
print an unlimited amount of money, countries have tried. Those countries would be Zimbabwe, Argentina, the Weimar Republic. They've either printed money or borrowed recklessly. So I don't know at what point we've borrowed too much, but there is that point. And preferably before we reach that point, we are gonna have to get our fiscal house back in order. There is at present absolutely no will to do that. Republicans like cutting taxes without any regard for the fiscal situation. Then of course, Democrats get elected and the Republicans suddenly start screaming about fiscal responsibility. The Democrats you know, spend without any regard for fiscal responsibility. Of course, having just lambasted the Republicans for their irresponsible tax cuts, the, there's, a, there's an old documentary called IOUSA, which is about this fiscal problem. And the best line in it was that uh, Americans like to spend like socialists and tax like libertarians. I'm, and the only thing that brings us together is an eagerness to spend money without taxing people for it. So they, they just can't go on forever. Right. And um, so to, again, to wrap, <laughs> to wrap up the government, I guess, talk, uh, do you think a, the government should do a better job of maybe promoting some of the good things they do? Because it seems to me that uh, not to sound too much like a, uh, you know, a maybe a Republican or a, like a lip, libertarian or something, but, you know, a private corporation does a very good job of promoting itself when, when, when they do something good and they don't really showcase things that they do poorly, obviously. Uh, Correct. Because and there's a, pro a there's a pro to, yeah exactly like, there's a profit. If you incentive. make a great product, you make a lot of money. Your share price goes up, and you don't really have to say a lot. People are like, "Wow, that company is doing a great job." You know, yeah. Apple, Apple. You know, they they could go on. Tim Cook could go on TV and say, "Look how great our Apple Watch is," or he could just say, "If you'd bought Apple stock 20 years ago, you'd have your own plane right now." So, uh, the the problem with government is, of course. When it succeeds, there's no profits for anybody. It means that you live longer or life is more peaceful or you prevent a pandemic. You, you know, nobody's talking about SARS or some of the other pandemics that were effectively stopped in their tracks. Uh, you know, I live in New Hampshire where we have a state epidemiologist. I never even knew we had a state epidemiologist, but presumably that person has done stuff to keep us healthier. So yes, I think the short answer is government should get better at extolling what it's done right, but I'm not exactly sure how you do that. I'll give you a perfect example. We as a country banned leaded gasoline in 1973 or 1974. Now, does anyone think that bringing leaded gasoline back is a great idea? You know, lead's what's in the paint chips that rot your brain if you eat it. So it's a really bad idea given that unlimited, unleaded gasoline is an affordable option that we should have leaded gasoline. But you know, by and large, people don't pause to reflect on that. The Clean Air and Clean Water Act. So while we're focused on our inability to deal with climate change, as we should, people don't pause to recognize that air quality in New York, where you are, in Los Angeles, in Denver, it's way better than it was in terms of particulate matter and ozone and things that give people asthma, cause premature deaths. Your drinking water, again, we focus on the exceptions like Flint, but for the most part, in most parts of the country, your drinking water is much safer than it was 20 or 30 or 50 years ago. To just, you know, to put a finer point on it, and I'm going to quiz you here. I know this is before your time, but do you know what the political impetus was for the Clean Water Act? Something happened. And this is often the case with legislation. People are arguing. There's not quite the political will. They think we need to clean the Great Lakes. Then something happens like, whoa, we really need to do something about this. Do you know what the impetus was for the Clean Water Act? I, there's not enough water? Or, uh, I'll did, give you a hint. It happened did it go in on Cleveland. fire? Something it happened fire? in Cleveland. The <laughs> Cuyahoga River caught on fire. So, and uh, you did not mishear that. I shouldn't a be laughing at that, but <laughs> caught on fire. People are looking out at a river and the flames, and they're like, wow, when a river catches on fire, we think water quality might be really bad. Yeah. And that was when, you know, of course, we had the scientists been saying for a long time that we've polluted the Great Lakes. Lake Michigan is now much cleaner than it was when I was a boy. You can now actually eat the fish that you catch there. And that's true of most of the other Great Lakes. So there have been many of those kinds of victories. I'm not sure whose responsibility it would be, whether the United States government should get a 
a better like press secretary for government. Part of the problem, of course, is that because we're so partisan, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats want to give credit to the other side. So they're bu so busy sniping at each other that they don't take the time to revisit what we've been able to do when we work together. So I think this is one of those cases where a toxic political environment contaminates our view of government and maybe prevents us from appreciating what has been achieved. Yeah, and, and I think that, that with uh, government might not have the profit incentive that private corporations have, but they their profit, uh, in, in my opinion, is the fact that people will keep trusting government. Oh, yes. The problem that we have in society as a whole is that people don't trust institutions, whether they be the federal government or, you know, uh, some people probably is science institutions, maybe the NIH or the CDC or the... Oh, this is devastating. And you can look at the data. Pew Research and other organizations like that have polled Americans on their faith in government. Or sometimes they'll ask specifically, do you think that most of the time government does the right thing? And you go into the 50s and a strong majority of Americans felt that the government did the right thing most of the time. It falls sharply in the 60s, in part because of Vietnam falls again because of Watergate. You, know, you forget the damage done during that, that period of time. Vietnam really cleaves society and then Watergate hurts our belief in the president, which has always been a revered figure uh, and in government in general. And it, I think it had ticked up again, but then it's kind of been falling it and it is at or near an historic low. And of course, if people don't trust government, then, as you said, they don't trust government scientists. They don't trust that the government is doing the right thing around COVID. They're less likely to believe that climate change is a problem. It is at the core of so many of other, our, our other public policy challenges. Another thing that I think people are, maybe my generation might be more guilty of it than other generations, but it's also, I think, historical ignorance. Um, Sorry, and ignorance of history, the, 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 the fact that we think we're the most, the government right now is the most corrupt it's ever been. All you have to do is open up Caro's book about Lyndon yeah. John, Texas in, in the early 1900s. Oh, Robert you, Moses. The yeah, Robert Burger. Moses. Yeah. So uh, Tammany Hall. New York's a pretty good place if you want to explore the history of political corruption. <laughs> Chicago, too. <laughs> Chicago, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, New York's kind of the history. Chicago's the contempt contemporary. You know, I yeah. think we've sent three prisoners or three governors to jail in my lifetime. Um, you know, and again, I'm not that old. So yes, people lose perspective. I think the other thing is traveling. I take students to a lot of places that would be delighted to have the institutions that we have, countries that have been torn apart by civil war where government can't deliver even the basic functions, electricity. You know, so I'm teaching a course on South Africa right now. One of the problems in South Africa, there is this remarkable political transformation in 1994, obviously, where apartheid ends, Mandela becomes president, but the country still continues to keep the lights on. There are routine power outages. The infrastructure is inadequate to what the country needs to do. So most of those places would gladly swap our government and our institutions for what they have. So I think, yes, history teaches us that we're relatively well off. Travel to other places teaches us that we're relatively well off. But in some respects, as you said, we're kind of insular in that regard. I'm not sure, actually, that your generation is any worse. I think we're all collectively ignorant of things that would put our own situation in a better perspective. And to your point about travel, uh, we'll transition maybe to your new book, <laughs> uh, maybe on a more optimistic note. Yeah, definitely. that's a very elegant transition. By <laughs> so why should, for, let's start with, why did you write the book? And what led you to want to go on this nine, nine month travel right. around the world with your right. family? Well, I, so I'm going to turn it on its head and answer the first question, the second question first, which is why we went on this family odyssey. So the book is called We Came, We Saw, We Left, a family memoir, family gap year, I think. And it's about a trip that our family took, my wife and our three children, who at the time were 18, 16, and 13. 
we went around the world together for nine months, nine months, six continents, three teenagers, the three teenagers being the most difficult part of that equation. We did it for a lot of reasons, one of which is that my wife and I did something similar after we graduated from college. We were not even married yet, but we took what people would now describe as a gap year, that term didn't exist then, after we graduated from college, and we traveled for nine months around the world. We found it to be informative. We found it to be like a fifth year of college education. It made a lot of things that we learned in an academic setting come to life. I'd been an Asian studies major. Being in Indonesia, seeing rice patties and those kinds of things suddenly made it all feel more real. It turned out to be, even though we were taking a year off and not working, I was writing articles for a local newspaper. So it actually got me started in journalism. So ironically, not working for a year was a remarkably good professional move. <laughs> we then, you know, we got married, we had kids, we had jobs, we had houses. We talked about the idea of doing this again, both because we want our children to enjoy all the things I just described, both because it's fun. I find it exhilarating to be in different parts of the world. I love to eat street food. I'm fascinated by other cultures. As we discussed, I always feel like I learn a lot about the United States when I'm outside the United States, looking back in or coming back after a long period of time. Professionally, my wife and I didn't want to retire but we'd been working for a long time and thought that nine months without working, we took leaves from our job, would be a nice way to kind of reflect on what we wanted to do next, kind of take a, a long-term rest, if you will. So that's why we did the trip. And then, of course, having I'm a writer at heart. I'm always writing something. So having decided to take the trip, then, of course, I'm going to write about it. And that becomes the fodder. And believe me, there's a lot of fodder for the book. You talk about in the book that uh, a lot of young people, especially out of college, feel this pressure to go work right away. I, I, I'm definitely guilty of that, too, because getting out of college, you, the last two months, you're going on these interviews and you're you're hoping that you have a job at the end of it. Uh, and yes, I don't and that, full, I don't fully blame people for feeling that way. Uh, yeah, because I don't want to out there. Believe me, I am pro work, and I do yeah. think that your children should have jobs. Yeah, uh, but but I'm not sure that that we need to be as anxious about it as we are. Certainly at Dartmouth, where I teach corporate recruiting, which is the formal process by which employers come on campus, students interview in a methodical way. It's usually for consulting jobs, banking jobs, insurance, other big firms. That's actually started earlier and earlier. So now sophomore year, people are even thinking about corporate recruiting, which to my, and by the way, they end up in the same basic places. There aren't any more jobs. It's just that the, the process of getting those jobs is now more stress inducing, takes longer, ruins the summers after maybe first year and second year college when you might do something more interesting, less corporate, all to no obvious benefit as far as I can tell. It's kind of an arms race. So I think that these other kinds of experiences are actually really good for you as a person, which in turn makes you a better employee. Like I am a better writer for having gone around the world the first time. That was where I developed my eye for being a reporter. Uh, I think I'm a better writer for having now written, written a memoir, something that I'd never tried to do before. And we should talk about, I wrote a novel while we were traveling, which made me a fiction writer. So it is ironic that the second time I went around the world, I had this kind of career epiphany as well. So I just don't, you know, obviously there are only so many years in your life. And if you take one of them to go around the world, that's one year less working. But other than that, I don't see these things in opposition to one another as much as other people do. I think that it's more complimentary. It makes you a, just like think of it as a fifth year of education. I mean, nobody thinks like, why are you doing your senior year of college? Isn't that going to get in the way of your of working? And the answer is, well, yeah, but then when I graduate, I'll be a better worker doing something more interesting and I'll be better at it. I think this is just, you know, your, your post-grad year. And what did your uh, kids think of the initial plan? Obviously, you outlined it in your book, but what did they yeah. think of the initial plan? Yeah. And then well, what did uh, they learn? I, I think I said in the book, the initial poll found that 66.7% of the children were in favor of the trip. <laughs> which is two out of three. The oldest, who 
would have graduated. So she graduated from high school when we took the trip. So it just took a gap year before college. So it didn't impact her education in any way other than the gap year. She was all in, she loves to travel. The youngest was gonna miss eighth grade. That's not exactly a huge toll. He was all in. It was the middle one, Sophie, who was gonna miss her junior year of high school, which is a big year socially. It's a big year academically, but that wasn't really her concern. She was a varsity volleyball player. She really didn't wanna miss that season. So she was not in favor of the trip. She wasn't vehemently opposed. So we were able to strike a deal with her whereby she stayed behind for the first two months or so so that she could play her volleyball season. She lived with my in-laws and then she met us in Peru and did the remaining seven months with us. That compromise allowed us to get everybody on board. Uh, why should stu well, students obviously uh, out of college or even take a gap year? I think in the in the United Kingdom, a lot of students actually take a year before college to go travel. Yeah, you yeah. see different cultures where this is endemic. In Israel, for example, people tend to do it after their military service. So they have conscri conscri conscription for both men and women. You go into the army around age 18, which would be kind of after high school here. People do their military service and then they will take off and travel. So if you're in strange places at a hostel, you'll often see just a large number of Israelis. There's a, certainly a culture of travel in, among Australians, in part because they perceive themselves as being far away from lots of things. So when they take off to travel, they go for a long time. The Kiwis and New Zealand do the same thing. Um, Canada, Switzerland, there are other places where if you're at a place where there are backpackers, you see these concentrations. And that's because culturally, it's a more common thing to do. And what's common, of course, makes more, it's like any other fad or, or culture, you know, people imitate what they see. As I said, I, I think it's a good thing to do because it makes you more aware of the rest of the world. It makes you a better citizen of the world. I, I think it also makes you more aware of yourself as a person. It gives you, if you've been racing through school, particularly through high school, certainly a lot of the students I see in college are burned out by the time they finish high school. They feel like they've been jumping through hoops and taking standardized tests. If you can get away and you know, read and reflect and think and meet other kinds of people, then you're that much more prepared. You're that much more mature for college. I will add that I often teach military veterans, so Americans who serve time in the, in the military before coming to Dartmouth, and they are just radically different kinds of people than my normal students. Instead of being 18, they're 24. They, they've been in Iraq, they've been in Afghanistan, they've fixed planes, they, they've done things that require enormous responsibility in decision-making. And then when they get to Dartmouth, they just have a more voracious appetite for learning. They approach the whole college experience differently. And you know, for people who are skeptical, let me point out, by the way, that doing something like we did either time after college or as a family is a lot cheaper than you think. Like this was not a luxury trip. When we went around the world the first time for nine months, it cost each of us about the same as it would have if we bought a Honda Civic, right? It was about $10,000. Like if we bought a Honda Civic after graduating from Dartmouth, nobody would say, whoa, look at that rich guy. <laughs> like, whoa, he's fancy, you know? And so. And going around the world with our family was actually cheaper than staying beh behind, staying at home. Our housing budget was simply the amount that we were able to rent our house out for divided by 30. We took the rental income and then used it on hostels. We spent less on food because food's cheaper in most of the places we were. A lot of our expenses like clothing and insurance and vacations went away. So the real cost of our trip was not out-of-pocket travel expenses. It was foregone income that we gave up nine months of income, uh, which again, that's a, that's a lot of money. On the other hand, if somebody said, uh, you're going to retire early, instead of working till 70, you're going to retire at 69. No one's like, ooh, look at him. He's super rich. Bill Gates over there. It's like, well, you know, one year we're in. Yeah, that's not Bill Gates' money. Um, so, you know, uh, I think it's more achievable when people rationalize that they can't do it because of the money. And usually they can't do it because there are other social cultural factors. Now that said, the one way we're really privileged, I mean, and there are many, but the one most relevant here is that we had flexible jobs, that we could take a leave of absence 
and come back. And that's not something that most people can do. So they might have to take a smaller bite-sized piece. So I, I wanna be clear about that. Uh, but I think lots more people have room to be lots more adventurous if they so choose. Yeah, and your time as a professor, for example, you, you again, you talk about it in your book, uh, your time as a professor took you around the world to begin with. Uh, I think you taught, you said you taught uh, personally in like the Middle East, I think a few times. Yeah, so I have taught a class first at the University of Chicago and then at Dartmouth that has always had a travel component at the end of the class. So we'll study some international topic like peace in the Middle East or rebuilding Liberia or finding the economic promise of South Africa. We'll study it on campus, the history, the economics of it, the policy challenges. And then the twist is that at the end of the course, the whole class will fly to that place of study and meet with policymakers, politicians, wow. journalists, NGOs, and so on. I started doing that when my kids were maybe like seven, five, and two, and they always came along. That was one of the contingencies. I told the University of Chicago, look, I'll teach this class. I'll even pay for my family to go, but I can't be away for two weeks while these kids are that age. So from a like crazy young age, my kids are used to like, walking in and meeting senators, meeting heads of state. My son met his first military dictator when he was like seven. Um, you know, was it? They, that was in Madagascar. <laughs> it was kind of a, a, a almost unfortunate situation. So this was, uh, there had been an election. I don't think it was a free and fair election. There was a candidate who was being propped up by the aristocrats in Madagascar. He was a former disc jockey, the United States, the EU, the African Union had all said that he, the president was not the legitimate ruler of the country. They needed to have another election. Through various ways, we were invited to meet with him. I actually had to go to the US embassy. We'd withdrawn the US ambassador in protest. So I had to go to the charged affair and say, hey, you know, is it gonna be a problem if we meet with this person who is an illegitimate despot and the ranking person at the US Embassy said, well, because you are an educational group and it will be a great experience for the students, yes, you should meet with them. You're not gonna do any harm to the international community of the United States and, or any reputational harm. So like most dictatorships, this guy had put up pictures of himself all over the country. I mean, you couldn't use a urinal without staring at the face of the president. He's everywhere, every shop, every building. And he looks young and attractive. I mean, it's a very robust photo. Well, it has been really heavily airbrushed. <laughs> so we walk in to meet with the president and he's sitting and I exaggerate now on something that looks like a throne. Like you couldn't make this up if it were a Saturday Night Live skit. So he's on kind of like a throne sitting above the table we're going to sit. And he's got a giant picture of himself right behind him. So just like, imagine I'm here and there's a portrait five times as big as me behind me. Uh. And CJ, my son walks in and that one's airbrushed, but the real thing is not. So my son walks in, he's got a loud mouth. He speaks really loudly and he walks in he, and he does one of these. And I can see what's going through his mind. It's like, wow, that picture does not look like the president. Something doesn't add up here. <laughs> the president, he's got pock marks and moles and he's much older and, and CG just blurts out, why is he so much uglier than his picture? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> and, you know, thankfully the language of Madagascar is French and the president among his other limitations doesn't speak much English. <laughs> so I don't think he understood, but I'm like, CJ, stop talking. Um, so anyway, being in a strange environment was not strange for my kids by the time they got to the ages that we did this trip. And uh, the story that I really enjoyed was the, uh, I forgot, I think you took your class to India, if I'm not mistaken. And one of your students got sick and your daughter, who was what, seven or six? At seven, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven at the time comes up to them and goes, were you and drinking, did you brush your of, teeth with she's water? She's kind of been old beyond her years. She was like a 50 year old woman at age seven. She's always <laughs> responsible. She's always, she's always telling me like, dad, I don't think you should be doing that. She used to, from her car seat in the back of the car, look over the seat and read the speed limit and say, dad, the speed limit is 30. You're going 34. 
you know, so she, she, so yes, we get to India. One of my students is having intest, intestinal problems, as often happens in India. And he's just, we've been in a roadside oasis and he's just bought himself some ice cream. So he's eating, eating ice cream. And, and she happens to be sitting next to him and he's complaining about his stomach. And she's, she says, well, I don't think you should be eating that ice cream. And he's like, oh, and she's like, are you brushing your, your teeth with tap water? He's like, yes. She's like, you shouldn't be doing that either. <laughs> so yes, the seven-year-old is lecturing this graduate student at the University of Chicago. Uh, and that in many ways encapsulates her personality. Uh, to maybe to summarize uh, with the book, how has traveling uh, changed the way you uh, behave maybe as a professor, as a father, um, and just as a person? Well, I think it makes you more humble just because you, know, you, you realize how diverse and interesting the world is. And you're just like one tiny, tiny piece of it. You know, sometimes I think you get wrapped up in your own affairs without any sense of what's happening in the places you're not in the Middle East or South Africa or the rest of Africa. So, you know, it, it's like staring at the stars for a really long time. It kind of puts you in your place. I think it makes you a better world citizen. You know, we've become so nationalistic in this country, I think at the expense of understanding and caring about the rest of the world. Are they getting the vaccine, for example? That was a big story in today's New York Times. It reminds you that we are one country in a world of 180 countries or whatever it happens to be. I think it reminds you constantly how eclectic the world is, all these different cultures that are so interesting in their own ways. And the good news from our trip is that those, I don't think those cultural differences are going away, even as we become more connected. Uh, different city, you know, the south of Argentina is always, I hope, going to be different than Lebanon, which is going to be different than Jordan, which is going to be clearly different than other parts of South America and so on. Um, I, I think it, it has not satiated my desire to travel. So curiously, I want to keep going to places I haven't been. I want to go to Morocco. I want to go back to the Middle East. Uh, I want to go back to other parts of Africa. So I think that marches on. Um, I would say those are probably the big ones. It certainly, as a parent, it has made me much more hands-off. I and mean, one of the things that you see in the rest of the world is that by comparison, Americans are very coddling of our children. And most of the rest of the world, I don't think this is necessarily a good thing, but you know, both my daughters would be married and have children of their own. Mm. So, you know, when when they say that they're not capable of doing X or Y, I'm like, you know, I think you're pretty capable of that. I mean, CJ, you know, they're kids running businesses at age 12. I remember renting a bicycle in Kathmandu from a kid who looked like he was about six and he's negotiating prices with me. I'm like, look, you know, you're not, you're three feet tall. Mm. So I think. There, again, I'm not sure six-year-olds should be running businesses. I'm not a big fan of child labor, just to be clear. But the capabilities are there. So every once in a while, when my kids, you know, seem ineffectual or can't get something done, I will. I thought my line is, you know, look, in any other country right now, you'd be married and you'd have your own herd of goats. Which is just a by way of saying, like, you, I know you can deal with that because, you know, five billion other people your age have dealt with it. Uh, so I think it does frame our parenting a little differently. I love to see parents let go a little bit more and trust their kids to fewer organized activities and more free play and more responsibility and those kinds of things. Um, and I think overall, uh, part of the, the, I guess the, the main idea maybe of the book is to, if you read it, you do have this, obviously now it's tough to go travel anywhere, uh, but when this whole thing is over, uh, people should go out and travel more and, and enjoy that kind of life. Uh, one of the, the interesting things that I encountered while um, preparing the, for this interview was your advice for graduation speeches. I, I, it, it, it's actually kind of fascinating. This maybe to, to, can combine two questions at once. Uh, it's interesting that uh, your publisher allows you to write books that are so different from the maybe the last because you have uh, like the naked series for example yeah. that tries to 
uh, explain in a very, maybe uh, to simplify for people, difficult subjects like money and economics and statistics. And then you go around and, and you write a, a, a travel memoir, and then you write a book about graduation uh, speeches. I found, I, I found uh, your, some of the pointers that you would give for your hypothetical graduation speech very interesting because the one I got in my graduation was very cheesy and, and kind of, you know, typical. But at the same time, my favorite and I think most people's favorite graduation speeches online are the ones that are very rah-rah. So it's uh, the Steve Jobs, the Conan yeah. O'Brien, the Dartmouth. Uh, uh, actually, the one I really liked was Admiral McRaven at University of Texas. He gave, which he turned into a book uh, called Make Your Bed. Uh, it seemed very practical. But overall, I feel like most people don't get a very good, realistic uh, commencement address. Maybe it's Maybe people don't want a realistic commencement address <laughs> well i think uh, realistic can also be upbeat I, you know so let me give you the the evolution of that book and it will also answer your question about how i can write so many diverse books all for the same publisher ww norton the speech so i was asked to give what's called the class day speech at dartmouth and it's the speech for just the graduates the day before the formal commencement which includes families and everybody else that speaker, by the way, was Conan O'Brien. So I was like the warm up act for Conan O'Brien, which was quite stressful. I had the same impression you did. As a speechwriter, I wrote commencement addresses that the governor gave, and they were not great. They were saccharine, platitude laden. And I didn't want to give one of those speeches. On the other hand, what exactly am I going to say? So I really did agonize for quite some time after I get the invitation about what I'm going to say. And then I had this epiphany which is because I myself went to Dartmouth and I would be speaking to the Dartmouth grads, I just said, okay, what would I have liked someone to tell me when I was graduating? Like when I was sitting in your seat, what did I need to hear that I didn't hear? And that became the impetus for the speech, which was called uh, Five Things That No Commencement Speaker Has Ever Said. Now, just as an aside, perfection is overrated because in the original speech, there were six things that I misnumbered. <laughs> there were two number fours in the original speech. Mm -hmm. It was like, number four, number four. <laughs> so it was, you know, and Dartmouth, when they published the speech, said, should, do you want us to keep two number fours or should we renumber for you? I'm like, you know, you can renumber. There's no sense dwelling on my own ability to count. So that's the speech. Now, it turns out that my publisher's daughter was in that graduating class. The speech went over very well. I got a lot of positive feedback. So I reached out to my editor and said, you know, there might be a book in this. And I, I let me describe the speech. And he said, I've already heard about that. And then, so that, that's kind of how that happened. But it speaks to a larger issue, which is just that I've, I have been extremely fortunate to have a very good relationship with my editor and my publisher. The editor is the one who actually edits the books. That's the person with whom you describe your next book project. They technically buy the book, which is the, you know, you make the internal agreement that that's what your next project is gonna be. I, until he retired last year, I had the same editor for all of these books, which was just wonderful. And we developed a relationship of trust where I described what I wanted to write. He gave me meaningful feedback. I delivered on that book. The books did reasonably well. That allowed wider latitude. It was a bigger sell when I came back from traveling around the world and said, hey, I've written a novel. <laughs> you know, like, now I'm a fiction writer. I'm an artist. But even then, uh, when they read the manuscript, they agreed to publish that. So uh, I've been fortunate that I've had a publisher like W.W. Norton that's got such a breadth of things that they publish. And they are the last independent publisher, which means they just have more latitude to publish great books than some of the other publishing houses that are part of large conglomerates that feel more day-to-day -day, um, profit pressure, which isn't to say these books haven't been profitable. It means they can take a risk on something that might not be a sure thing. Yeah. Uh, are you saying that you gave in a full book? Don't people usually give in proposals before? Yeah, they... yeah. So what I would do... So. Oh. Uh, Usually what I actually did with all of these books is I sold the proposal. That's mm -hmm. what we negotiated. So, but the proposals got shorter and shorter, which each subsequent book. So the proposal for Naked Economics, which is the first naked book, was probably 30 pages long. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The proposal for naked statistics, the second was probably five pages. Naked money was a paragraph. Uh, and 10 and a half things was an email. <laughs> so like, <laughs> uh, you know, I think as they develop faith in my ability to deliver content and we all kind of get on the same page, that process gets easier. Mm. Uh, but overall, I, I really do. I did like the advice you gave in your the, the, the book about the, I think it's called 10 and a half things. No yeah, commencement. So in the book, it was expanded from the speech and it's yeah. called 10 and a half things that no commencement speaker has ever said. Right. Um, so to wrap up, so what, what gives you hope for the future um, in all, on all fronts? And what is, what is a piece of advice that you would offer people to stay optimistic? And the second part of the question, and that's a, a question I kind of finish off all my interviews with, what are five books on any topic that you would recommend to people? Yes. Okay. So let's start with sources of optimism. This is one where your, your own advice helps, which is to look to history. The country has dealt with far worse. World War II was worse than this. The Great Depression was economically far more disastrous. I mean, people literally starved to death during the Great Depression. And if you look around the world, other people are struggling with greater things. So the United States, for all of our weaknesses, is a resilient place. There is some truth to Winston Churchill's aphorism that America always does the right thing after we've exhausted all other possibilities. So I think there's an ability in this country to reinvent itself. It's not usually our first impulse, but I, I look to history and I'm encouraged by the things that we've managed to overcome. And again, you look at challenges like our current racial situation. And I think if you look, you know, which is not to excuse the current situation, but we've come a really long way. And we've come a really long way because a lot of people have worked very, very hard to get us that far politically, in the courts, in social opinion, in entertainment. So I think on any issue that you care about, even COVID, like the vaccine was a miracle. And the technology used to make that vaccine is going to make us safer going forward. So there are lots of, you talked about why government doesn't trumpet its successes more. I think we could also say that across the range of developments, good news doesn't really sell. You know, the New York Times doesn't put on its headline, life expectancy higher than 10 years ago, childhood disease is eradicated, you know, just, you know, for whatever reason, it's not what we want to read about. So things are better and things are better because a lot of people are doing great work to make them better. Um, so I look to that as a source of optimism. I think of late, I've been reading that a lot of the new technologies that have been kind of pernicious, so pernicious that, so for example, social media and the internet, you know, we kind of wallow in all the things that are bad about them, but they also facilitate a lot of things that will make us more productive and therefore people will enjoy broader prosperity. And those things are coming along down the pike. If you watch the democratic primaries, for example, everyone was very critical of the pharmaceutical companies and then we got the vaccine. So I'm vaguely optimistic that technology for all the bumps will make us better off down the road. I think we've probably hit bottom politically. There are a lot of very good people working on improving various facets of our political system from getting money out of politics, some of the electoral reforms that I talked about, ending the disenfranchisement of groups, this voter suppression that's being tried in various places. So, uh, you know, there, there is definitely optimism, but you gotta work at it. I think what I want people to take away is you, you can't sit in your lounge chair and watch the news and expect the world get better. I mean, democracy is not a spectator sport. So my one admonition would be get out and do it. Uh, so in terms of books that I would recommend, um, I'm gonna start with one that I think helps to explain politics. So Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind. I think it's right it, behind okay. me, actually. Is it right behind? Okay. Yeah. If you haven't interviewed him, you should. That is the very best book at explaining why we are politically divided. It is nonpartisan. It's rooted in moral psychology. It explains why liberals and conservatives put different stock and different virtues, loyalty, equality, sanctity, those kinds of things. And boy, when you've read it and then you look up, light bulbs go off all over the place. It explains so much in terms of what's going on. Uh, if we're looking to history, I'm kind of going to jump around here. 
I think pretty much any of the Robert Caro books you alluded to. I mean, if you've got the time, read the whole series on LBJ. What a ride. <laughs> because, yeah, what a ride. First of all, it'll give you a better understanding of American government and the Senate in particular than you'll get from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. LBJ, again, in the Senate, he, he was not probably as well equipped to be president, but as a as Senate majority leader, he was probably the most masterful politician in the last hundred years, I think. Uh, but The Power Broker is another Cairo book. I mean, Cairo is really about uh, politics and how it corrupts and how people get power, how they use power. I think that would be good. Um, I think we've already talked about, I think any of the Michael Lewis books are really good. But I think The Big Short, even though the financial crisis is in the rearview mirror, what The Big Short does really well is first of all, explain the financial crisis. I think most people still don't fully understand what happened, but he connects the dots, how the real estate bubble led to the real estate collapse and then how Wall Street was selling all these complex derivatives that just took what might've been a localized problem in one part of the economy and just turned it into a complete forest fire. He does that in a very entertaining way. He's a great storyteller, but there's also a moral there which is that lots of people did things during the financial crisis or in the run up to it that made perfect sense for them because the incentives were broken, but were disastrous for the, the rest of us. So mortgage brokers originating loans that they knew people couldn't pay off, the ratings agencies giving AAA ratings to financial derivatives that should not have gotten those ratings. So I think that's a great book about finance and incentives and humans and so on. Um, I'm going to offer a fiction book. I think The Razor, Razor's Edge by Somerset Mom is, I think Somerset Mom is a brilliant writer. The Razor's Edge is about a Chicago guy who grows up in an affluent family. His family wants him to become a bond trader or something respectable like that. It takes place maybe after the turn of the century, 1920s, 1930s. And he just has this desire to go off and explore the world. And so you can see that that had some impact on me. I read it in high school. I've reread it two or three times since. Um, and I just find it to be a great book for inducing self-reflection and encouraging people to get off whatever track they may feel that they've been put on. Uh, and last, I'm gonna go with a documentary film, um, which is a fog of, The Fog of War, which is based on Robert McNamara's autobiography. McNamara is probably most closely associated with running the Department of Defense during the Vietnam War, but he'd also been involved on behalf of the United States government during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He, played, he was a soldier or a commanding officer during World War II. And what McNamara does, he's got kind of 10 lessons from his life. And he walks through everything from the firebombing of Tokyo by U.S. For, uh, allied Forces in World War II, which he points out was a war crime and that we would have been prosecuted as war criminals, but we won the war, to Vietnam. Um, but I think the most interesting part of that book, which is probably unique, is that McNamara, who was involved with the Kennedy administration during the Cuban Missile Crisis, during those tense days, what was 13 days, when there could have been a nuclear exchange, he knew all about the American strategy. He had an opportunity to sit down with the living members of the Soviet Union and Cuba who had participated on the other side. So it's almost like you get to recreate a sporting event. Like if we'd done this, what you what you would have done, you know? And he really he kind of walks you through how if we had reacted slightly differently, then Castro would have done X and the Soviet Union's. My Soviet Union might have launched a nuclear war. Like there were lots of ways that could have gone wrong, but there are very few times in history where you come close to war and you get to kind of run through what happened with the people on the other side. And then he did the same thing with many of the people leading the North Vietnamese effort in Vietnam. And, and it helps to explain how we misunderstand, misunderstood what was motivating the North Vietnamese, Vietnamese forces, that it was much more nationalistic struggle and a communist struggle and so on. So I think that is a movie that just has remarkable insights into policymaking and, and war and conflict uh, in any context. Great. 
uh, Charles Whelan, it's been a real pr- pleasure. Uh, I've wanted to have you on ever since I started this podcast. So thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Oh, it's been a delight. Thank you. Thank you.